Right, so welcome to the second video on depression that I've got for you. Um, whereas the first video was all about symptoms and characteristics, this video is going to be much more about explaining where depression comes from. And we're going to be looking at a cognitive explanation for it um, rather than anything else. Okay, so according to the cognitive approach, emotional problems uh, such as depression are the result of cognitive distortions. Cognitive distortions are essentially irrational thinking. Um, and there are two key cognitive theories that we're going to go through today which attempt to explain depression. So the first one is Beck's cognitive theory, and then the second one is Ellis's ABC model. So, Beck's cognitive theory of depression, put forward by Beck, surprisingly, in 1967. So, Beck was under the impression or believed that some people's cognitions, so their, their thoughts, make them more vulnerable to depression. Okay, and he said that there were three parts to that vulnerability. Okay, so there was something called faulty information processing, something called negative self-schema, and then those two things together work to fuel something called the negative triad. Okay, so we're going to go through all three of those now, just so that everybody's clear on what they mean. Okay, so first off, faulty information processing. So Beck found that depressed people are more likely to focus on the negative aspects of a situation whilst ignoring the positives. So they distort information, which is a process known as a cognitive bias. Um, Beck detailed numerous cognitive biases that people could have. Um, two of the more common ones are overgeneralizations and catastrophizing. So, for example, somebody with depression um, may make overgeneralizations where they make a sweeping conclusion based on one single incident. So, for example, I failed one of my end of unit tests and therefore I'm going to fail all of my A level exams. Alternatively, a depressed person might experience uh, catastrophizing where they exaggerate a minor setback and believe that it's a complete disaster. For example, I failed one of my end of unit exams and therefore I'm never going to be able to study at university or get a good job. Okay, so one is an overgeneralization. I made one mistake or I did one thing badly therefore they're going to do everything badly and the other one blowing something out of all proportion um, I have failed on one test and therefore my entire life is ruined and I'm never going to be able to go to university or get a good job okay so that's faulty information processing that's attending to the negative and blowing it out of all proportion okay now, moving on, self-schema, or more importantly, negative self-schema. Okay, so if you think back to the cognitive approach that you covered um, at some point, or that you will have covered at some point, um, if you haven't covered it yet, then it won't be far off. Um, a schema is a package of information, a package of knowledge um, that stores information and, uh, and ideas about things that we might encounter in the world around us. Um, they help us to interpret information, they help us to predict what's going to happen in situations, um, they help us to organize information in our minds. Now a self schema is all of that but it's a bundle of information that you have about yourself. Um, and those schemas are developed during childhood. And according to Beck, depressed people possess very, very negative self schemas, which may come from negative experiences, for example, a lots, of, lots of criticism from parents or peers or even teachers. Um, so examples of negative self schema are, for example, an ineptness schema. So, which makes sufferers expect to fail. 
So they might see themselves as a failure. They might um, expect failure if you if they have to sit a test, for example, they might expect to fail. And if you ask them why, they might just say, well, why wouldn't I have failed everything else? I don't know this. Um, I'm never going to do very well um, because I can't do it and I'm stupid or whatever. Um, they might also experience, experience a self-blame schema. And that makes them feel responsible for any misfortune uh, that they might have had in their life. Um, or they might experience a negative self-evaluation schema um, that constantly tells them or reminds them that they're worthless. Okay, obviously they're not worthless, but this is again one of those um, one of those examples of a cognitive distortion and about how information coming in um, can be distorted and interpreted incorrectly. Put very simply, you could say that. A self schema is how you see yourself and how you think others see you as well. Obviously, if you think that's bad, then, or if you think that's negative, then um, not only are you going to judge yourself very, very negatively, but you're going to assume that other people are also judging you very, very negatively, which, as I said earlier, will um, lead to you misinterpreting or distorting information that comes in okay and then finally you've got the negative triad now according to Beck um, negative self schemas and cognitive biases maintain the negative triad um, which is a negative view of three aspects of a person's life which then ultimately lead to depression so these include negative views of the self. Um, so, for example, nobody loves me. It then involves a negative view of the world. For example, the world is an unfair place. And then negative views of the future as well. I will always be a failure, for example. So a person develops a dysfunctional view of themselves because of three, these three types of negative thinking. And they occur automatically um, and they occur regardless of the reality of the situation. It's very important to remember. And it's those three ways of thinking that according to Beck are maintained by negative self schemas and cognitive biases, um, but also that lead to depression. Okay, so moving on, that was the first topic. The second explanation is Ellis's ABC model. Now, Ellis took a little bit of a different approach to explaining depression, um, and he started by explaining what's required for good mental health. Um, according to Ellis, good mental health is the result of rational thinking, which allows people to be happy and pain-free, whereas depression is the result of irrational thinking, which prevents us from being happy and prevents us from being pain-free. So conditions such as, such as depression and anxiety are the result of irrational thoughts. Okay. And Beck created this ABC model, and the ABC model stands for A is an activating event. So, for example, we experience a negative event, which then triggers B, which is the belief. The belief can be either rational or irrational. Obviously, a healthy response or a healthy uh, belief would be a rational belief. However, irrational beliefs are then more unhealthy and then will lead to something like depression or anxiety. And then the consequence is then the emotion that comes from the belief. So rational beliefs may lead to healthy emotions, whereas irrational beliefs would lead to more unhealthy emotions. Okay, so on the next slide, I've got just a little example for you. So this example would illustrate how an activating event friend not greeting you in the corridor, for example, can be rationally or irrationally interpreted. 
So irrational thinking or interpretations leads to unhealthy outcomes, for example, depression, whereas rational and logical thoughts lead to good mental health and happiness. Okay, so if you have your activating event, uh, you pass a friend in the corridor at school and he or she ignores you despite the fact that you said hello. Now, your belief is your interpretation of the event, which could be the rational or irrational. A rational interpretation of the event might be that your friend is very busy, possibly stressed, maybe he didn't see you, maybe he didn't hear you, um, maybe he was talking to somebody else at the time. Who knows? But that would be a rational, logical way of thinking about it. Whereas an irrational interpretation would be that your friend dislikes you and never actually wants to talk to you ever again, and he or she ignoring you um, is just their way of telling you that. Okay, so according to Ellis, rational beliefs then lead to healthy emotional outcomes. For example, you might just say, I'll talk to my friend later and just make sure they're okay because it's not like them to not respond or to ignore me. Whereas an irrational belief, an irrational belief, um, may lead to unhealthy emotional outcomes such as depression. So for example, you might say, right, they've ignored me, so I'm going to ignore them. I'm going to delete their number. I'm going to unfriend them on Facebook. I'm going to unfollow them on Twitter, whatever. Um because they clearly don't want to talk to me, and so I don't want to talk to them. Okay, so that's, by comparison, a very, very unhealthy and irrational way of dealing with it. Okay, so as per usual, I've got a couple of evaluation points for you here. Um, I've chosen two, just one of them is a strength and one of them is, in a, is a limitation. Um, just in case you ever get asked to discuss, obviously for a discuss question you need a strength and, an eva and, a, and a limitation. Um, so here they are. I've put them in appeal paragraph for you so that you can have a little look at how that would be. Um, so the limitation is the fact that there are alternative explanations. So there it is. Um, obviously feel free to pause it and give it a read. Um, the the general gist of it is that there are other explanations for depression. For example, the biological approach, which looks at genes and neurotransmitters, um, which then goes on to talk about serotonin and how people with depression very often have low levels of serotonin, um, which then elaborates on the fact that you know we treat depression very often in using. Uh, drugs such as you know antidepressants, SSRIs, that kind of thing, um, and the fact that they work, you know, suggests that there is something biological there. Um, and then the link, nicely towards the end there, uh, just talks about the fact that actually, at the very least, we could consider a model that takes both biological and environmental things into account for example a diathesis stress model okay so feel free to pause that and have a little look i will move on to the next to the next evaluation point um, so the strength is the fact that the theory has practical applications it's always a nice strength to have the fact that it applies to the real world so in that you've got um, the fact that it's applied in therapy, for example, through CBT or, or REBT, which is um, Ellis's, well, which is a therapy that's developed from Ellis's ABC model. Um, so these therapies attempt to identify and challenge negative and irrational thoughts, and it is considered to be one of the most effective types of treatment particularly when they are used together with drug therapies as well and again the fact that they are they are very very good in therapy actually suggests that um, you know it, it's a good explanation it's a good theory because it has been um, properly applied and usefully applied to helping people as well Okay, so they're just two evaluation points. I'm not going to give you any more than that um, because that should that should be enough. Obviously, if you are pushing for those top, top, top band 
um, essays, then you might want to throw a third evaluation point in there, but those two should be a good start for you anyway. Remember, any evaluation point that you use needs to be fully elaborated and expanded on using the Peel structure um, so that you make the most out of them and so you get the most marks for them. Okay, I hope that has been useful. Thank you very much for listening.